So good morning. I thought I would um, start with a little bit of context from well, you know where I come from in terms of business perspective. Who's going to go? That's all right. It's okay. Having um, am I in the right place, yeah. So having uh, run businesses, this is something that occupied my thinking all the time which is, you know, you create ideas if you think about how far and how fast you can get ahead of your competition. When you run around talking about ideas that are incremental, that's sort of one step ahead. You can well imagine your competition's working on something very similar, but internally it's easy to get people to align and to want to go after that idea because they understand it. Two steps ahead is a little bit harder. Maybe there's some risk in there, but the truth is most of the work that I've done in business, and, and including what I'm doing right now, is all about how do you get three steps ahead? Because it's really the only place that you're going to make money. Most of the businesses that I've competed with have just as many smart people, they have just as much money, and you're really all looking for how do you get some advantage in the midst of what you're trying to accomplish. And I will share the same comment that Eric did, you have to disrupt. It's where the growth is going to come from. You have to break open or break into a market and do things differently if you want to uh, grow your business. And so this is really involving two things. One is you have to increase the affinity for your brand or you have to make your competitor more vulnerable. And, and you really have to get down to those kind of brass tacks of how am I going to grow this portfolio, in my case, portfolios of big brands, and how you can think about where you're going to get advantage. So thinking this through from the perspective of how do I get information that I can leverage to my advantage? You know, we all think about how do you get close to the customer, how do you understand what they're looking for, and it led me in my time in running big businesses at Glaxo and then ultimately when I was working in innovation to think about um, how we understand choice. So for most of the work that companies, including my clients now, are doing is you go out and you ask the consumer what they want, you test that, you do surveys, you do lots of bases testing, all the things that are involved in the rigor with how you decide to put $100 million behind something and take it to market. And as somebody running a portfolio, I would find times where we did all the same things. Sometimes it would fail in market. Sometimes it would fall behind what our financial project projections were. And other times it took off like a shot. So there's so much variation and variability in terms of how you can follow your customer, your consumer, and develop what you think they want. And that led me to a place to understand, in choice, we have our conscious, rational thoughts. When you ask somebody um, what they want, you get involved with products like weight loss, and suddenly you realize the information you're getting is very, very unreliable. And then you look at how decisions are made from a non-conscious, and uh, some people refer to it as the subconscious perspective. And so I started to think about um, and looking in the literature and had lots of resources available to me at Glaxo in terms of how much of choice is coming from this ra rational set of motivations and how much of it is coming from the non-conscious motivations. So if we think about, and I'm doing this in very simple terms, what's involved in our non-conscious thinking, where motivation is coming from to make a choice, you see things like we know, memories and values influence why people choose the products that they choose. Um, people show up at my office now saying, you're the company that can help us dial up the emotion and desire for our products, because that's <coughs> happening at a deeper level. Um, intuition and instinct, it's actually one of the few times you know you've got non-conscious thoughts operating in how you're going through life, and that's because you can feel it. Intuitively, there's something wrong here. I see what the data says. This is not right. I can feel it, right? So you're aware that you sometimes have these conflicting thoughts as a business leader, and then how habits and customs come into play. I don't know if any of you have um, seen or picked up Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. You're looking for a reference on conscious and non-conscious thinking. It's an excellent read. He's won the Nobel Prize in Economics. Um, if you're looking for a friendlier read on this topic, Malcolm Gladwell, book Blink a number of years ago gives a kind of basic primer around why the non-conscious matters so much. But the truth is in business we haven't had any tools to do this. And that's where my passion comes from in terms of you do need to understand what consumers want and talk to them and observe them in their habitat if you will. Um, but you also need to understand these deeper motivations and we have not had the tools to be able to do that and look at that in the way that would be meaningful for our business. So if you look at this chart, this is not from Glaxo, but I could have shown you a chart just like this. Um, this is research that I have been involved with 
uh, this client did this test in Europe and in the US which produced these results. That gray line is testing a whole series of concepts for new products. The gray line represents the conscious rational data out of the research and the green line represents the non-conscious. So remember what I said about how you're looking for discriminating data that maybe your competitors do not have? This is starting to show us some places where we can understand preference in a very different way. So this data um, on the right hand side, this particular company said, look, we're gonna go about and do our typical research. We wanna see what those results would yield. Uh, we also did the uh, standard research, but I'm only showing the results on the right from the non-conscious results to this data of these concepts, okay? The client almost had a heart attack when they saw this. Um, and for two reasons. Number one is if you had launched 527, concept number 527, the person in uh, Europe said to me, so we would have left a lot of money on the table, right? Because when you start thinking about, um, we have correlations on 221, concept number 221, number one and two, right? But if non-consciously the preference is operating very differently on the left than on the right, they may not be optimizing in terms of what they're thinking about the customer really wants. Um, what I can't show you is they also had data that they had been struggling to understand some things in their market that this started to answer because they were having false positives on data and they were launching things and they were sort of a bust. So this is not an either or set of data, this is about and. This is about looking at a holistic perspective of how people make choice. And that's um, research that I've been doing for um, now almost four and a half years, really thinking about how do you do this. And we're working across a variety of methodologies, but in this particular study, what I'll tell you is we uh, built a set of analytics around um, latency response, timed response, which essentially works like you're presented forced choice pairs and you have milliseconds to choose an answer because it actually takes a little bit of time for your thoughts to move out of your non-conscious into your conscious. And so if you look at the scientific literature, you'll find out well calibrated what that threshold of time is, and you have to get an answer from the customer below that threshold, so you recruited a non-conscious response. This is used quite a bit in the social sciences, and, and we've just used it for this purpose in business to get to a deeper response. We've also done work, and I'll show you this in a minute, in fMRI, but it's expensive. You have small sample size. In this study I just showed you, we had 500 people um, in Europe and the US take this test. If you're doing this in other kinds of methodologies, you're working with smaller sample size than we really desire. And just another minute on this, um, you can see here that um, from a, the perspective of the um, validity of the data, looking at large sample size, this is done on a laptop. So we build a set of analytics and we run this research all over the world, from China to Brazil to the US, et cetera very easy to do um, and therefore it's affordable because that's important to business. You have to have methodologies we can use repeatedly and do that at a cost that is um, acceptable to do for the number of concepts and other kinds of work we do in packaging, testing television shows, television commercials, lots of things where clients are not getting meaningful insight out of the same research they've been doing in their industry for 10, 20 years. I mean, they just keep repeating things where the client will say, we've, we've heard this a hundred times before. They can't get to new information. And so as these kinds of tools, this is a burgeoning science that will continue to develop quite a bit over the next few years in thinking about how do I get a deeper understanding of what's driving choice. So I'm gonna take you um, just to an example of one tool that we've built around this kind of methodology. And this is um, in reaction to thinking about how do you understand the relationship that you have with your customers? How do you quantify that? Because in my um, experience in working in business, we have collected all the rational reasons that people are using the products they do or attracted to particular markets. This is about quantifying the emotional response. More of your emotional response is happening down in your non-conscious. And so I became very interested in how do you quantify the relationship that a brand has with its customer base. And this may sound like a, a little bit of an odd um, piece of work, but we began to look at how does religion create followers? Not even a product that you hold in your hand. How does religion create followers? And so we've done quite a bit of work, um, everything from looking at smokers and, and um, ways in which we understand the reward center in the brain, things that are really motivating people, and starting to look at how does this um, correlate to 
brands. So we've done work with devout Christians looking at their responses in fMRI machines and comparing that to a collection of brands we thought were very strong, like Apple, Harley-Davidson, and contrast that with brands that are very weak. AT&T, you see, um, is one of them. There were 12 brands in each of these uh, strong versus weak brand cells. And so we began to look at how do people react to strong brands versus weak brands, and how does that correlate when we did a lot of research around devout Christians and exposing them to religious iconography. How much activation do we get in the brain around this? And um, then that work expanded where we did qualitative research around the world, uh, everything from Buddhists, Muslims, Christians, etc., to talk to religious leaders about what are the dimensions of how religion connects to people. It doesn't matter what religion we're talking about. So part of this was looking at how we respond in the brain, and part of this was looking at the people who run these religions. If you don't know this, the Catholic Church actually has a chief marketing officer, which I thought was pretty interesting, um, and, and how these people are thinking about their religion. While the labels are somewhat different, these were the 10 dimensions that almost came up universally around these religions, and I doubt you need me to explain this because most of these are pretty intuitive if you start thinking about the dynamics around religion. Um, the only one that I often say to people is vision. We're all trained to write on our strategic plan. Here's the vision of my brand. In this case, this is if you stop a customer of that particular brand, do they know the vision of that brand? Well, they do for Apple, they do for Harley Davidson, they do for very strong brands. They know why they're connected to this brand. So we wanted to quantify these dimensions. And what I'm going to show you is a little case study that we did with technology brands looking at the results of this. So imagine that I give you a description of storytelling. I give you some examples of storytelling. So you read that, you understand what I'm asking you to evaluate, and then you're scoring these brands according to those dimensions. But you're doing this non-consciously. You do not have the time to sit there and contemplate and say, well, how is this like Disney? Um, you're really having to answer on a non-conscious level. You're getting a reflexive answer to this. So on the conscious part of this test, any kind of survey you wanted to do, this is how these tech brands scored on these dimensions. Okay? So the scale doesn't change, and here are the non-conscious responses. They're different. And there's some degrees of difference in terms of the particular things we're testing. So we had a conversation with Google around storytelling and said, you really could beat Apple on storytelling. You should spend time on storytelling because I don't even know what the story of Google is. I thought I knew it was search, now it's something else. Why don't I know the vivid story of Google? If you think about how things important to memory, story has a short connection into your memory. You'll remember stories you were told as a kid, right? But you will not remember the facts and information that I rattle off about you know, my product. It just is not part of how we connect to memory. The story is critical. And so this is a fact base now that brands begin to use. I gave a talk at an annual meeting at Hewlett Packard and I said, you are our poster child for the world's most transactional brand. You have brilliant distribution and you operate on razor's edge price and you don't have anything else. Why would you want to run a business like that? You have to earn every single sale at the register. You need to be developing your relationship. It, it's, it was painful then, it's painful now to look at where they're going with this organization and why the customer has no real relationship with them, right? So this kind of information sat with a, a marketing team. You begin to say, why are they so much higher on one particular thing versus another? It changes the conversation. It changes the focal point. You're really looking to be in a relationship with these um, customers. You're not looking to earn every single transaction, which tends to drop you down to price. Um, this uh, research we also did in multiple countries. So I'm showing you an example here of when you talk to a big global organization, <laughs> you sometimes find the global team is located in a geography and they think they understand the relationship people have. This is a heritage brand or this is a cutting edge brand and it varies around the world. And so it can be sobering for the core team to have to look and say, what is the relationship in a particular market and how do we think about that in its totality? I've also had people want to run this research before they enter a market. They're competing with a lot of local brands. They're coming in as the multinational. They actually want to know what relationship do people own before I step onto that turf. So there's a whole variety of ways in which people look at this. And then we say to them, you know, if you're really looking at the top 
four drivers, no brand is trying to go after all 10 of these. You're playing strategy here. What are my strengths and weaknesses? What are their strengths and weaknesses? Which of these drivers can I own to create connective tissue between you and this business? Um, we repeatedly see mystery show up in Japan. Uh, mystery is about having the opportunity to kind of fill in the blank, right? You don't give me all the facts and information. This is a culture that really enjoys puzzles. They like to fill in the information, create some intrigue. They lean into that. Know that if you're gonna sell in Japan, if that's something that's an opportunity for you, right? Lots of brands don't play with mystery. We wanna tell you everything we can about our brand, right? That's why you wanna buy it. But sometimes holding back and allowing people to lean in is um, something that can be quite interesting in how you build a business. We also test non-consciously attributes. The little story I wanna tell you about this and you can read the attributes across the bottom. This is a set of attributes this industry has been tracking for years. So you can create any new attribute you want or use the industry strand standard, but what they wanted to see was how does the non-conscious response to these attributes look compared to what we know. Um, we had the occasion to have a conversation with someone at Microsoft who said, it doesn't matter, let them have cool, we get it, they are all about cool. We have a warehouse full of research that will tell us that cool does not matter. And we said, are you sure? Because when we correlated to non-conscious response on these attributes to preference, cool went from being one of the lowest in the conscious data to the number one next to value as why somebody's buying in that market. If you think about that for a minute, when computers first came out, a lot of these attributes would vary. But as the industry matures, we don't worry about whether we can trust this particular piece of apparatus or not. And so these discriminators of why people are buying what they're buying is shifting. Now, if I consciously ask you in a survey, did you buy that device or that computer because it was cool? Most people will not tell you that's why they bought that, right? It doesn't sound good. I don't really feel good about myself. I sound frivolous, actually. Say, I bought this because it was cool. Of course I bought this because it has the right features. It has all these other things. But the truth of the matter is, cool is a very strong driver because a lot of this stuff is good enough. It's the same. It's got little differences, but I'm picking the one that's the color I, I want or for some other dimension related to cool. These are very, very important dimensions of how people can understand what I'm selling and who's buying what. And then you can begin to take those attributes and say, if I'm really trying to drive off of grandeur, how can I correlate those attributes and understand ways in which I can build my business around particular drivers that I want to be able to um, advance. So that's just to give you a little bit of a snapshot of this particular area where we are trying to quantify the emotional exchange going on inside of relationships so that our clients actually start thinking about this. You don't want to be a transaction business. You want to be based on a relationship. And when you quantify that, you can now start to manage against it. And then the last thing I want to show you and then I'll, I'll wrap is we've also built an image bank around the world. Um, and that means that we've been testing images for their emotional connection and meaning. And so you see a sample of 24 of those. The way that we do this is in um, any variety of tests that we're doing, we put the images in and ask the consumer at a non-conscious level to match the images to the particular concept or package or whatever it is we're exposing them to as stimulus. And so I can show you this example of a piece of output. We did this for Wired Magazine. Um, relative to their competitive set. And so what you're looking at are the top four images that people associated with that brand. And then you begin to look at the top four images that are happening against each of your competitors. Um, we have a semiotics expert who works with us on this. And what you're looking at in the bar chart is the response to the top, those 24 images we put in the test. We sometimes pay as much attention to images that don't correlate as we do to the images that are highly correlated. And then you can see, we had to take some commentary out, but you can see just some examples of some of the things that we know about these images and what that means for the brand, but its value in particular is in contrast to your competitive set. So you can begin to understand what's driving that relationship. Um, and that's it for me, just a kind of a fast little tour of some, I think, interesting areas that we're working in in order to get better information behind the business decisions that we're making and understanding in simple terms why people buy what they buy. Thank you.